Hello everyone and welcome to this biopsychology lesson on hemispheric lateralization and split brain research. Okay, so just very briefly then, um, the idea of hemispheric lateralization is that certain functions in the brain are dominated by one hemisphere or the other. So for example, in most people, language is dominated by the left hemisphere. If you remember from the localization lesson, uh, language is actually dominated by specific areas in the brain, such as Broca's area and Wernicke's area, both of which are in the left hemisphere. So actually, if you think about it, language is both lateralized and localized, which is just something to bear in mind. However, like I said, language is dominated by the left hemisphere of your brain. So, like I just said, the ability to produce and understand language for most people is controlled by the left hemisphere. This suggests that for the majority of us, language is subjected to hemispheric lateralization. Now, the question of whether other neural processes may be organized in the same way was investigated by a series of experiments conducted by Roger Sperry and his colleagues. And these experiments were known as split brain research. Sperry's research was conducted in 1968, and they were a series of studies that involved a unique group of individuals, all of which had undergone a surgical procedure known as a commiserotomy. A commiserotomy is a procedure in which the corpus callosum and other tissues that connect the two hemispheres are severed in order to control severe epileptic seizures. Now, if you have a look on the screen, you can see the corpus callosum in the image that's there. It is the structure in the brain that connects the two hemispheres. So it's what allows both hemispheres to communicate with each other. And in these particular participants, that connection was severed. That means that the communication between the two hemispheres was removed in these patients. That then allowed Sperry and his colleagues to see the extent to which two hemispheres were actually specialized for certain functions and whether the hemispheres performed tasks independently of one another, which is something that we didn't really know before these studies. So how did they do it then? Sperry devised a general procedure in which an image or a word could be projected to a patient's right visual field, which would be processed by the left hemisphere, and then the same or a different image could be projected to the left visual field, which would be processed by the right hemisphere. Now, in a normal brain, the corpus callosum would actually share the information between both hemispheres, giving a complete picture of the outside world. However, presenting the image to one hemisphere of a split brain patient meant that the information could not be conveyed from that hemisphere to another because the communication between the two hemispheres was severed. Okay, so just so that you can imagine what I'm talking about, I'm going to give you an example of what his procedure would have looked like. So when the black cross appears in the center of the screen, focus on it. And that was it. Okay, for those of you who were quick enough, you might have seen in your peripheral vision that there was something that popped up on the left-hand side of the cross, but only very, very quickly. Now that's what Sperry did. Okay, so he may have flashed up a word, he may have flashed up combination words like toadstool or key ring. Sometimes he flashed up images as well, like that. Now I would imagine that most people watching this video can see that that is a face. However, for a split brain patient, it might not be as simple as that. And Sperry did this with a variety of different stimuli 
and recorded the results, which I'm going to go through with you now. Now, Sperry did a number of different trials on his experiment, um, each time testing something slightly different, and the results are actually quite intriguing. So these are some of the trials that he did. So the first one was describing what you see. So when the image or the words flashed up, the patient had to say what they saw. Now, as you can imagine, if the word or the image was flashed up in the right visual field, then the patient was able to say what they saw because the right visual field links to the left hemisphere and the left hemisphere has language centers in. If, however, the image or the word was flashed up in the left visual field, which is connected to your right hemisphere, the patients typically didn't report seeing anything or they couldn't say what they saw, which again could be attributed to the fact that your right hemisphere doesn't have in, well, for most people, your right hemisphere doesn't have any language centers, um, but your left hemisphere does. Now, normally, the two hemispheres would communicate, and so it wouldn't matter which visual field it had been flashed up into because um, the two hemispheres are talking to each other, and so you'd be able to say what you saw. But because in split brain patients, the two hemispheres aren't talking to each other, there's no communication, and so your right hemisphere cannot identify or cannot verbalize what it saw. Moving on, you then had one trial where people were asked to recognize by touch. So the way this word, this one worked was that if the word or the image was flashed up into the right visual field, again, they were able to say what they saw. But if it was flashed up in the left visual field, they weren't able, again, just like with the last one, they weren't able to say what they saw. However, they were able, using their left hand, which is connected to their right hemisphere, they were able to pick blindly an item out of a bag without looking at it that matched what they saw on the screen. If they couldn't find the exact item, they were at least able to pick out an item that was the most similar. So, for example, if a cigarette had been flashed up, even though they couldn't say the word cigarette, they were able to pick out a cigarette out of a bag. And in one of the examples, a cigarette wasn't in the bag, but the patients managed to identify an ashtray as being an item similar or related to what they saw. In the next trial, Sperry used composite words, like you can see in the picture in front of you, keyring where one of the words would be flashed up in one of the visual fields and the other in the other visual field. Now, as in the picture here, what he found was if key ring was flashed up, then the patients would be able to say the word ring because ring is in your right visual field, which is connected to your left hemisphere. They wouldn't be able to say the word key but using their left hand, they would be able to draw a key. And then as soon as they had seen what they were drawing, they were then able to say the word key and put the two together, which not only emphasizes the language capabilities of the left hemisphere, but it also highlights the creative drawing capabilities of the right hemisphere as well. Now, this final one is also fascinating. It's all about recognizing faces. So, in one of the scenarios, they used images by a famous artist who would make pictures out of other things. So, for example, he would make uh, faces out of fruit. Now, for this scenario, it worked a little bit differently. So, they would show a picture of the face, it would be presented to either the left or right hemisphere. And then afterwards, they'd be given a choice of two words. The two words would be face or fruit. If the picture was shown in the left 
visual field, the participants or the patients would point to the word face. If, however, the picture was shown in the right visual field, connected to the left hemisphere, the patients would point to the word fruit. And what that shows us is that our right hemisphere is very important for facial recognition, whereas our left hemisphere is more analytical and it will break things down into its component parts. In this case, it is going to be fruit. Okay, so you have an analytical side of your brain, which is the left side, and you have a creative side of your brain, which is also responsible for things like facial recognition, which is your right hemisphere. And that is the type of stuff that has come out of these types of study. If you have a look at the information box that comes with this video, um, you'll see a couple of links in there um, where you can watch a video of Sperry's research where you can actually see some of these um, situations in action so you can visualize a bit better what I actually mean and what it is that I'm talking about if you want. Right and now it's time to go on to a little bit of evaluation. Right so I've got two evaluation points for you. The first one is a strength and it focuses on the fact that this type of work was very pioneering, very influential, and gave us a lot of knowledge that we didn't have beforehand. So there it is for you, set out in the Peel structure. The essence of it is that we have, because of this type of research, we've got an impressive body of findings. Um, it's shown us what the left and the right hemisphere are geared towards, what they're good for which are key contributions to our understanding of the brain and brain processes. So that is a definite strength of this type of research. However, a limitation is that it has issues of generalization and also issues of control, particularly when you consider the, the participants in the study as well. So this is a bit more of a chunky point. Um, but again, the point is here that the patients that Sperry used were not great. Um, first off, split brain patients are an unusual sample, um, and you very rarely encounter sufficient numbers to be useful for research. Sperry only had 11 people that took part in the basic procedure. Um, they all had history of seizures, which could have influenced the findings. Some of the participants experienced more disconnection of the two hemispheres than others because some of them had varying levels of the pr procedure carried out. Finally, also Sperry had a control group which was made up of 11 people that didn't have epilepsy, but that's a little bit of an inappropriate control group. It would have been much better and much more valid if his control group had had epilepsy but hadn't had the procedure to split the two hemispheres. So a lot of a lot of extraneous variables there that could have impeded the validity of the research. Okay, so you've got two evaluation points there. Um, as I have said in my previous videos, you might want to go and use ones from the particular book that you're using. You can use these as well by all means, um, but this is how you should be laying them out to get maximum marks on a question. Okay, I hope that has been useful. Thank you very much for listening.